What's up guys? Is there anyone in the world who hasn't heard that song from back in the late 90s? I seriously doubt it. It's Jason here and welcome to my YouTube channel Company Insight. Today we'll be taking a step back from the corporate world and explore the life of one of the biggest pop stars of all time. In this video, I'm going to talk about the story behind the dramatic rise and fall and rise again of the iconic Britney Spears. What's your most memorable image of Britney Spears at her peak? A strawberry blonde smiling Britney Spears in a miniskirt against a plaid miniskirt? If you're like most individuals who are staying at home these days because of COVID, you likely spend at least some of your week mindlessly watching something on Netflix, Hulu, or whichever other streaming service to pass the time. In the sea of B-movies and occasional sleeper in-house Netflix documentaries, there's one that stands out recently. And if you've watched it, you're likely to have a very different impression of Britney Spears thanks to the Hulu production Framing Britney Spears. This Hulu documentary explores the phenomenal rise and fall of Britney Spears, the latter of which is partly due to a court-mandated conservatorship dictated by her very cunning father, Jamie Spears. But before we get into the hashtag Free Britney movement trending on social media, let's rewind to the 90s, way before Spears was reportedly worth $59 million. But first, I just need a quick favor from you. If you wouldn't mind just hitting that like button for the YouTube algorithm, it would really help me out a ton. The more engagement a video like this gets, the more likely the YouTube algorithm is to push it out to more people to enjoy. And as this is a brand new channel, it helps out a ton, and it's free to do. Thanks for doing that, and now let us continue on with the rise and fall and rise again of the Princess of Pop. It's back to the 90s, the rise of Britney Spears. It's 1993, Britney Spears auditions for the Mickey Mouse Club, a variety show that was wildly popular at the time and also served as a hotbed for rising young pop stars. Spears was 11 years old and shared the spotlight on the Mickey Mouse Club with other soon-to-be stars including Christina Aguilera and Justin Timberlake. What's important to note is that her 1993 debut on the show was actually hard won and gave a hint of her ambition. It was her second attempt at joining the show, after first being rejected in 1990 for being too young at eight years old. While on the show, Spears shines as a bubbly, approachable, and talented singer. By 1994, the Mickey Mouse Club was canceled, but Britney Spears wasn't about to let her momentum go to waste. Just three years later, in 1997, Spears signs a very average contract with Jive Records because she's an unknown in the realm of chart-topping singles. What did she actually earn? $250,000 as an advance and a royalty rate of less than $1 per record sold. To put that in context, megastars like Celine Dion have royalty rates of at least $220 per record. Once Spears got ready to release her first album after recording it in Sweden, it's already 1999. What's on the radio? Maybe Believe by Cher, Every Morning by Sugar Ray, and Baby One More Time by this debut singer named Britney Spears. Like her fellow Mickey Mouse Club alum Christina Aguilera, who's also on the rise, this Britney Spears is a mix of sexiness and teenage innocence. With her Baby One More Time debut album, Spears garnered platinum certification twice by the Recording Industry Association of America. For those of you who are wondering, the platinum certification is given to albums that sell 1 million units. For anyone who remembers listening to the radio at that time, it should come as no surprise that the album ended up selling 10 million copies. Besides having a smash debut album, Spears also dominated the charts with her eponymously named lead single, whose success can arguably be attributed to the nice but naughty music video. In it, as many of you may be able to vividly recall, Spears is a scantily dressed student in an uptight Catholic school where she daydreams about being a successful pop star who also wins the love of her all-American handsome school crush. With the perfect mix of sexy, cute, and catchy, this lead single stayed on the Billboard chart for 32 weeks. The next year brought more financial windfalls for Spears with her second album, Oops, I Did It Again. Not as totally bubblegum pop-oriented as her debut album, the eponymous single reached number 9 in the United States and topped the charts in countries such as the United Kingdom, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada. Spears kept her trademark risque outfits on this album cover, but included edgier numbers, such as a cover of the Rolling Stones hit, I Can't Get No Satisfaction. It was almost as if Spears was testing the waters to see just how far she could push her mostly teenage fan base that, 
we should remember, was growing up in real time with her. Now, don't get me wrong, Spears also included fairly routine pop tunes such as Lucky and Don't Let Me Be The Last To Know. For fans of hers who also like Christina Aguilera, Shania Twain, and the Pussycat Dolls, they had a lot to enjoy. The results? The second album went platinum four times over and sold about 24 million units worldwide. Spears had avoided the dreaded follow-up album flop that tended to make or break pop artists. Going into the 2000s, the continued rise. By 2000, Britney had confessed publicly that she was dating lead in sync singer Justin Timberlake, who also happened to be another Mickey Mouse Club alum. She was on a personal and professional role. By 2001, she had released her third album, named Britney, in the same vein of Madonna's first name only status. Ironically, it also seemed as if Spears was trying to channel a more mature sound, trying to follow Madonna's footsteps, as she had previously described the pop diva as always having been four steps ahead of everyone. Selling 15 million copies, the cover of this album nonetheless looked decidedly different. In contrast to the baby-faced Britney of yore, she was now staged in blue-hued, moody lighting with her hair fashionably tousled and shockingly pouting. The cover looked more Rolling Stones than Spice Girls. Even singles like I'm a Slave for You and I'm Not a Girl, Not Yet a Woman alluded to many of the feelings her teenage fan base thought they felt. Moodiness over an unfulfilled high school crush and ambiguity over their identity as in between being a girl and a woman. The golden touch that Spears appeared to have at this time led to her landing a seven to eight million dollar Pepsi endorsement. That year continued to be busy and productive for the star, who performed at the MTV Music Awards and angered many watchers on two fronts, her choice of outfit, or lack thereof, and using a live python as a stage prop. Spears was fighting a war on two fronts, parents who thought she was a bad role model and animal rights activists who thought she was encouraging mishandling of animals. Trouble Brews, Restaurant Nyla and Relationships. With her growing wealth and brand recognition, Spears ventured outside of her comfort zone as many celebrities do. In 2002, Spears, along with other investors, opened a Cajun-influenced restaurant named Nyla that paid tribute to her southern roots, with Spears having been born in Mississippi and raised in Louisiana. The restaurant's lackluster start was a sign of turbulence to come. Just how ominous was Nyla's beginning? Well, its manager claimed that on opening day, it was already $350,000 over budget. Its debut kept increasing as after its post-celebrity studded launch, it drew fewer customers. That lack of cash flow, plus several health violations and the sudden switch from Cajun to Italian cuisine saw Nyla closing in the same year it opened. From 2002 to 2003, Spears faced a somewhat tumultuous year that took a toll on her public image, if not her finances. Timberlake and Spears publicly affirmed that they were indeed more intimate during their relationship, despite Spears having previously asserted that she wanted to remain a virgin until her marriage. She explained, I've only slept with one person my whole life, she said. It was two years into my relationship with Justin, and I thought he was the one, but I was wrong. Hmm. In addition to this perhaps not so shocking news, Spears further spiced up her public image by sharing a sultry kiss with Madonna at the MTV Video Music Awards in 2003. That likely highly choreographed event coincided with the release of her edgy album, In The Zone, being released that same year. Fittingly, In The Zone showed the wild side of Spears, making the album her fourth consecutive to debut at number one while the fast-paced and nightclub-friendly single Toxic actually won Spears her first Grammy for Best Dance Recording. Marriage number one. Perhaps because of all the newfound notoriety Spears had gained, in 2004 she decided to push the envelope a bit further and in the process seemed to paint herself as a pop icon on the verge of a very early midlife crisis. She rang in the new year by getting married to Jason Alexander, a childhood friend in Las Vegas. Supposedly, she proposed to him, he accepted, and to make a long story short, 55 hours later, their marriage was annulled. Part of the reason for the annulment, according to Alexander? As he put it, everyone went crazy because there was no prenup. That everyone? Spears' mother and her manager at the time seemed worried they, and Britney herself, would lose her hard-won money. Marriage number two. 
As 2004 rolled on, Spears shocked fans again by announcing her engagement to one of Justin Timberlake's backup dancers, Kevin Federline. They married that same year after only dating for three months. In one year, Spears married twice and tried her luck again at a business opportunity outside of her life of work, perfume. Her first attempt at a perfume, named Curious, was the number one perfume in department stores, at a time when department stores were still a thing. All of the public fascination about her public life fueled Spears' increasingly messy private life, which she bizarrely chose to share with fans and detractors alike on, for instance, a reality show about her married life in 2005 aptly entitled Britney and Kevin, Chaotic. The chaos of their relationship only grew worse over the next two years, with Federline's non-stop partying despite their two children together, which grated on Spears. By 2006, she had filed for divorce citing irreconcilable differences. Her life quickly went into a tailspin after her second marriage collapsed, turning public opinion largely against her as well. For instance, in 2006, Spears was photographed looking heavier than her usual trim self with her son at her lap while driving, rather than safely tucked away in a car seat. Spears acknowledged that it was not a wise decision as a mother, but also noted she had been pursued aggressively by photographers at the time. Rehabilitation and conservatorship. By 2007, she had checked into a rehabilitation center in Los Angeles, reportedly at her family's urging. Whether her parents, especially her father Jamie Spears, were more worried about Brittany, their daughter, or Brittany, their cash cow, is subject to debate. After leaving the rehab center, Spears immediately went to see her children, then at the home of her ex-husband. Once Federline refused, Spears decided to famously shave her head and get two tattoos of pink lips. Shortly after, Spears is infamously photographed with her new look attacking a paparazzi car with a large green umbrella. The Spears of yore and the Spears of 07 seemed like night and day. As a result of her seemingly erratic and very public emotional outbursts, Kevin Federline petitioned for and was granted primary physical custody. Only in 2008 did Spears and Federline's relationship become calm, even enough to negotiate joint custody. The events of 2007 are largely perceived to have given her money-hungry father the leverage to successfully obtain a conservatorship over his daughter. If you've watched or heard of the recent documentary Framing Brittany, you likely know that a conservatorship is when, in California, a judge appoints someone to care for the finances and well-being of an individual deemed to be incapable of doing so independently. Typically, a conservatorship is thus used for elderly individuals with memory lapses or individuals generally who are emotionally and or intellectually unfit to take care of themselves. 2008 onwards, the rebound of Britney Spears. Starting in 2008, Spears slowly starts making headway and re-piecing her image through guest star spots on television shows like How I Met Your Mother and successful tours like her 2009 circus tour, which raked in $131.8 million. Besides her live performances, her music also has some notable hits, such as her 2011 single Till the World Ends, which rose to number three in the Billboard 100. While number three doesn't sound as great as Spears' glory days of being number one, it was still an impressive comeback for a pop icon who had just earlier been lambasted as everything from a bad mother to a cheating girlfriend to someone who is mentally unwell. At the end of 2014, she signed a four-year concert residency at Las Vegas where she made $475,000 per show. And guess how many shows she performed over those four years? 248 shows. Insiders estimate that she made over $100 million performing in Vegas. Even though Britney went through tough times, she's proven she's a mastermind when it comes to branding and being a businesswoman. Current Britney. With her career at least not in decline again, it's a little bit surprising that Spears' August 2020 petition to have her conservatorship altered really brought her back to the masses again in a way that's very relevant to our times. Spears petitioned to have her father removed from the conservatorship and instead had multi-family trust Bessemer Trust appointed co-conservator of Spears' estate, in addition to her father. Spears has the opportunity to again appeal the conservatorship later this year. Interestingly enough, though Spears started out as someone perceived as a brainless sex symbol, she's become a symbol of female empowerment thanks to framing Britney Spears. 
The documentary has helped to focus on her talent as a singer and burgeoning businesswoman who has been infantilized by the men around her. The public's willingness to take a fresh look at Britney Spears also shows that the times are truly changing. So with that said, thank you so much for watching my video. There was a significant amount of research and production that went into making this video possible, so if you wouldn't mind giving the video a like and leaving a comment in the YouTube section below, it would really help out a lot. What did you think of Britney and her evolution over the years? Be sure to check out some of my other videos, like The Rise and Fall of New York and The Rise and Fall of Discovery Zone from the 90s. Thank you again for watching, and stay tuned for another episode of Company Insight next week.